Here we are, it's the Physics 105A video lecture. Physics 105A video lecture 11. And I'll start off with an announcement. So next semester, hopefully we're back to normal and it'll be 105B, the continuation of this class. I would like to open up one unit recitation sections. And what we do there is I have a maximum of four students, three to four students in each section. So if there were 12 students in the class, we'd have three of those sections. And we meet once a week and we just work problems at the board. This is really the best thing ever. I've done it before, it works fantastic. You work problems at the board, you prepare nicely, and the rule is that you have no paper with you, no notes. You just go up there and, and figure it out. It leads to great uh, discussions and it's a great skill so that will build everyone up so i recommend it and i'm just putting it out there now and we'll see if we can get that started you know if enough people want to do it we'll do it if not we'll let it slide it would be a like i said one unit class probably a 190 class it's uh, called independent study or something but there's some there's some formal way to get it done and you get your one unit and your grade Good, so that's an idea that uh, you may want to just consider. What else is going on? Today, I will probably won't talk for as long as before, but we're working on the whole absidal angle business, and I have to give a perspective on why that's such an important and interesting topic, too. Okay, so let's just begin with the, the whole central force review in a nutshell, for starters, and then we talk about circular orbits, and we talk about nearly circular orbits, and then we're on our subject. So what do we have here? We have a force law. Of the central force type. Like that. That then gave us a potential energy put that like so that's u of r we then had energy conservation we also had l um was equal to r cross m r dot was constant that gave us angular momentum conservation so that's where we went into the plane polar coordinates and that formalism. So yeah, with these things, we then ended up with L equals M R squared P dot. We're in the plane polar coordinates now. One half M R dot squared. This one here. L squared over two M R squared plus U of R is equal to E. So those are two conserved quantities, L and E. And we integrated this up for the Newton potential and got our elliptical orbits in the Kepler problem. <clears throat> Good, so we could even, um, then we had, so I'll just put here circular orbits. And we found last time that M R naught omega sub T squared A prime of R. Okay. And let's see, ner nearly circular orbits. Nearly circular. We also have this omega sub r is equal to the root of the second derivative of the effective potential at the circle divided by m. And where this comes into play, and I'm gonna send this entire thing up there and but hold it there. Here's our effective potential, and we'll just draw the effective potential for the Kepler problem. It has all the properties we're interested in. Okay. There's our circular orbit, okay? 
So that's everything in a nutshell. The circular orbit is at this small energy. If we have a slightly greater energy with the same angular momentum, then we're in that nearly circular orbit. And, you know, there's an R min and an R max, and in the limit that we're talking about, they're very close together. That's why I say it's nearly circular. But for our sketch here, of course, we exaggerated a bit. But yeah, we have an oscillation in R here at the same time as we're sweeping out angle in feet. Um, anything else here on this graph? Well, yeah, we could say we've got the nearly circular orbit between those two radii. Those pictures never come out that well. All right. This up here. So then I had introduced the idea of this absolute angle. And I'm just going to spend the time discussing that, give you guys one more problem, and show you what it's all about. Okay, so we had... Hey there, I was about to say, look up absence. Absolute angle. And that is this angle swept out if you take omega sub t times e sub r divided by 2. And you know we have omega sub t, e sub t is 2 pi, omega sub r, t sub r is 2 pi. But these are not, are no longer necessarily the same. So your homework was to take the definition and this was also, could also be written pi um, omega r divided by omega b. And if you use this definition and analyze the effective potential graph, you get the formula that I had as a homework problem for you guys to obtain pi over root 3 plus r0 u double prime of r0 over u prime of r0. And don't um, mistake this for the effective potential. Now we're talking about the actual potential energy function. And you know, just I'll write the equivalent version here because our homework problem is going to use it. We can of course talk about the force as well. And then this would be f prime of r0 divided by f of r0. That of course is trivial. So this is the one you want to prove. And the example I gave was for u of r equals minus alpha over r. And then we found that this angle was just equal to pi. So what is that? That's just the closed uh, Kepler ellipse orbit. That's to be expected. Okay, so what is the utility of this if this is what we get out? The other example, I'm going to put this on the homework. U of R is equal to um, alpha natural log R over A. When you differentiate this, you'll see that the A drops out of the problem. Okay, but... So let's call this homework. These are, these are all trivial, but they're all noteworthy. Okay. This is, we'll call this homework, and you'll see this was an example on your exam problem, right? This is the, what we had for the exam, that potential. And a couple of you actually made it to here and saw what the answer to this is. Because okay. after all, it's the ratio of these two frequencies, and I had asked for these two frequencies. Now, if we draw these two examples, maybe one graph with the same, let's see here. So we've got these two concentric circles. Yeah, good luck on this, let's see here. Yeah, there, okay. Circle, 
a second circle. Okay, it says. So we're starting at R min, and we're sweeping out a certain amount of angle. Maybe I'll use a different color. So we came out to R max right there. So the angle that was swept out is this one here. And if this is equal to pi, then of course we would have landed right there. But here you see this isn't a closed orbit. When we go around another half period in R, we'll end up somewhere here. And in fact, what you'll find is this example is of this type. So that can show that uh, if you have the Newton potential, the pure one here, then you have these closed orbits, this is pi, but otherwise it's not. Okay. And if you have a good wrist for this, you can draw these rosettes. You, know, you may get an orbit that does something wild like that. Okay. Now, so what is this practically? The practical application we're going to talk about now is the Newton potential, except Newton's law of gravity in our solar system is not a perfect point potential, okay? because our sun is not a perfect sphere. The Earth is not a perfect sphere. And the, the deviation from sphericity actually leads to a deviation from this simple form. And the deviation is... Uh, Actually, not difficult to describe, but it would be very difficult to integrate. You couldn't do the integration that gave us these Kepler ellipses. Okay. We have another strategy to deal with it. Let's see. I'm tempted to leave everything on, but now we'll send this up. Okay. Yeah, this all has to go. Okay, so here's our example. Um, so let's put this in words first. The case where u of r is close to, but not exactly, close to, but not exactly um, equal to minus alpha over r. As soon as we have, a, a, for example, a sun that's rotating about its axis and therefore bulges out of the equator, it's no longer a perfect spherical symmetry, no longer 1 over r. Okay. So we have to be able to deal with that. And I'll give these examples. Um, and we're going to do this next semester explicitly. We're going to calculate out this type of thing. So we'll have u of r is minus alpha over r. Let's write that a little more clean. u of r is equal to minus alpha over r plus beta over r cubed. That's actually the next term in a systematic expansion of 1 over r. So I can even say plus and so on. And here we could say beta is just a real number, it could be positive or negative, and small, okay? And what determines small, you know, we could work out as well. Okay, so that would be a potential, yeah, try putting that in our integral that we all did for homework, try putting that in there and getting a, a closed form result. You're not gonna be able to. So we have approximation methods of which this is one. The other example I'm going to give Suppose you had u of r, um, actually before I do that, let's put a couple of words here. This is, like I said, this is the next term in a systematic expansion, okay? Um, so we'll kind of, we'll call that, this actually, this comes from the multipole expansion, so I'll write from multipole expansion. Good. Here's another.
another example. This one is maybe a little, a uh, little contrived, but not too contrived. So this one is suppose we have u of r. Ah, in fact, here's the point. This one we we're not able to write u of r in closed form, but we write down the force law. And the force law, we're going to say, is minus alpha over r squared. So that would be Newton's law. But it's going to be shielded. And therefore, we're going to multiply this by e to the minus r divided by a. And so what would that look like if this is your Newton's law, then this shielded one at some great distance of r decays faster. So here it's all the same, but eventually it decays faster. In the limit as a goes to infinity, then you're back to the regular x of r, okay? So this is the one we're going to do for our homework and find out about its absolute angle because we have a nice limiting case. In fact, we may do both of these. Um, if we do this one, the limiting case will be that we're saying beta is very small, and when we do a little expansion, we'll find out how small it has to be. Okay, so this would be the limit beta small. This, the limit we're taking would be a very large, so that this ratio is very small. So these are homework, and you know I'm getting ambitious for you guys. Maybe we'll do both of these, and uh, if we can't get them done by Friday, we would save one or both of them for the next for the next homework assignment. Yeah, so this again comes from the fact that the sun is not a perfect sphere, so we get this change to the Kepler of to the potential. And uh, this could be a shielded type of potential if you're, say, orbiting in electromagnetic uh, fields, and you'd have something shielded at great distances. Or you could propose this as a, as a um, modification of Newton's law and see what the consequences are. And you'd have this parameter here, if you make it large enough, um, then you get Newton's law, okay? Okay, so what's found for both of these is that your absolute angle goes from being equal to pi exactly to somewhat different than pi. And this that also has great, uh, interesting repercussions. Okay. So what happens if this angle is Instead of being, you know, wildly different from pi, is very, very close to pi. What happens is that you can think of your slight, you know, your slightly elliptical uh, orbit um, as being not closed. Here, let me draw this. Okay, we'll do it in red. What can happen is this. So we're close, there's pi right there. Say we come up short of pi. Try it once again here. Gonna work a little sketch. So once more, we've got these two concentric circles. Close to, but not exactly pi. So we come out here, okay, not exactly pi. And then when we come in for the next minimum, we made it to here, okay? So there's that much difference in the angle. But it's close enough to this slightly elongated circle of ellipse that we can think of as the entire ellipse rotating, okay? The entire ellipse will, will rotate. If you were to exaggerate this thing now, you would have, I'll draw more of an ellipse, Okay, you'd have this thing here, there's its center, and this object itself would, would be rotating in time so that so and so many orbits later it would be oriented like this. Okay, that's the idea. Then we could say when beta is uh, not equal to zero, when a is not equal to zero, the ellipse, the original ellipse precesses, okay? So let's put that in words. 
equal to C. So again, a note approximately equal to pi the ellipse or the merely circular ellipse uh, precesses. with uh, omega, I'll give it a capital omega precession. So with its own little precessional frequency, and that precessional frequency is simply equal to omega sub phi minus omega sub r. Just the difference of those two frequencies. If they're equal, then this precessional frequency is zero because this angle is pi. But that's what we're working on. Let me get you started on this one here, since let's call all of this homework, all of these statements, and I'll get us started on them. So homework, this whole thing, the homework in a blue box. So this precessional, this is a fun little problem as well. And if you not complicated, but if you get it, then you'll see what's going on here. Okay, Let's see how long we've been going so far. Okay. So now that we have our project here, I'll go ahead and send this up. Um, actually, another interesting point. First of all, the blue line goes around this top one as well, because that's our problem. Here we go. I want to do all this. Okay. So these two problems plus this right here. So three little problems. Yeah, you'll notice here this force, we can get F and F prime and plug it in there. What you'll find is if you try to integrate this one up, you'll come out, you'll get a surprise. Okay, so this is one where you're not going to have the explicit u, but you didn't actually need it because your u prime is f and u double prime, f prime. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing is you're not going to get a simple closed form on this expression. You're going to have to do a little approximation on both of these. Okay, But what you do know is that in the appropriate limits, you're going to get a three minus two. You know, you're going to end up with a one here, but you're going to end up with one plus something small. Okay. So what do we do if we have one plus something small there? I'm going to this one. Okay. This one we can't even write the integral down explicitly. It's got, a, it's got a name all of its own. You have to look at that. So let's take this one here. U effect U is equal to minus alpha over R plus beta over R cubed. So first of all, what's the effective potential? That's L squared over 2MR squared. And we've got this minus alpha over r beta over r cubed. And there are a couple of judgment calls on this whole thing. First of all, this beta over r cubed term does not extend all the way to r equals zero. It's a correction term for large r. Otherwise, you would say that would destroy our whole argument with the effective potential, but it's not affecting the thing at very close range. So here's u effective. Question is, how would this thing graph 
It's a modification. Um, so as R goes to zero, this is not playing any role. So here's what we'll do. We'll graph the one we know. This would be the Newton version and ask, how does this term modify that? How, as R goes to infinity, it really doesn't modify it. Okay, This one still dominate, dominates. And for R goes to zero, this one is actually not applicable because it's a large R expansion, okay. which we'll see next semester. We'll do this. We'll do this whole thing formally. So. Okay, right now you just got to take my word for it. So really, the modification of this curve itself is pretty subtle. We can't actually draw the modification. We just have to be aware of it. If this is right here, I could say this is R zero comma for beta equals zero, then the R zero is going to be changed a little bit. Okay, it's not going to be changed that much. And the problem is you actually can't just calculate it explicitly. So what about R zero, which is the, the radius of circular orbits? Well, if you take the derivative here, you affect the prime, there's our criterion, of course, so we, we're going to end up with minus L squared over, not two, over just M, L squared over M R cubed, plus alpha over R squared, minus three beta over R to the fourth. Yeah, try solving. <clears throat> try solving for that. Probably not that clean. Okay. So we don't actually find this R0 explicitly. We're just going to argue that for small beta, it's close. Okay. And that's all we need to do. Okay. In our formula, we actually use the limit beta goes to zero case, and the R0 is the same one um, as, the, as just the classic Kepler problem. Okay, so for that, uh, we have that there. Okay, equals zero comma when. So what would we actually have if we did this here? Well, we could multiply the top through by r to the fourth. And see what happens. Okay. So here's what's going to happen when we go into our formula, which I've erased. So now we're looking at pi over root 3 plus r0 for this one, yeah, u double prime of r0 over u prime of r0. We're going to get something. What we want to do is bring it into the form pi over one plus something small. And that something small there will contain a bunch of stuff and making beta small enough will make whatever is here, what I'm calling x, will make that small enough. So what do we do when we get to this point? Right. This doesn't have to be such a simple expression. It could be very simple. On this problem, it's very simple. On this one here, it's a little less simple. Then you have to remember your expansion for f of x equals 1 over root 1 plus x. And if you don't always memorize those, you can always get them out just by doing a first uh, linear term in a Taylor expansion. Okay. So that's equal to 1 plus x to the minus 1 half is equal to uh, 1 minus 1 half x. Okay. But I should even say it's not equal to, it's approximately equal to, because x is much less than 1. So if you haven't done this before, you could possibly just want to show that as well, just for your own satisfaction. So yeah, so you'll get these absolute angles, and they are one of the things astronomers are going to look for 
uh, when they're um, short. Theorists are also going to want to know about when they want to know about whether the theory of gravity is really working. That's one more comment I'm going to make here as we close this up. So let's see. Let's have this expression right here. And actually, this difference in frequencies is good, too. You may have heard of the precession of the perihelion of Mercury. Um, and that's what we're talking about right there. And this is very closely related. So, suppose you're checking whether Newtonian gravity is really true. And this is, goes back centuries now. This has been done. Because the Earth is not, or the Sun is not a perfect sphere, as soon as the accuracy is great enough that the astronomers have at their disposal, they're going to see that these orbits are not perfectly closed. Okay? There are these precessions of the elliptical shape. There are these absolute angles. So this was known before general relativity, and it even had to be uh, worked out to make sure that all effects of the non-sphericity of the sun, of the, and more importantly, of the outer planets, they also you know, have mutual gravitational attractions. So all those things had to be uh, understood, and then, as the accuracy got even greater, there was still some discrepancy between what we'll call these angles as calculated and as measured. Um, or I should say these angles as calculated versus as measured. And so a new theory of gravity that you know is, shows up in the very, very detailed measurements, that was Einstein's uh, theory of general relativity, um, was then able to account for those discrepancies. So this is actually something that goes back very far and still important to establish whether, you know, whether a theory is right or wrong, because the perfect Kepler orbits are not actually there. If you look close enough, they're never perfect um, Keplerian orbits. So these are, the, these are the ideas that allow us to investigate these things further. Which is to say we're, all, we're really in some interesting, powerful techniques already here. And like I said, next semester we will do these expansions so we actually have that and, and we're not just giving it um, for free. So we'll do these expansions ourselves and then see a little more about this. Good, I think this is enough for you guys to get started on. You were going to prove this formula that's what I said last time. And then in addition, we'll do these absolute angles for these two problems, for this potential here that I started us off on, and for this force law, which fits into this format as well. And in both of them, you're going to end up having to make some kind of approximation of an expression like this, and then you can use that approximate formula. Okay, good. So keep taking great notes, and we'll see you next time.